we find ourselves right after Paul summons us to consider Christ's example of humility and the, the great declaration of Christ's divinity as he was exalted and he was made Lord of all as the eternal God-man. But not only does his exaltation call for our worship, but it also calls for our obedience. Just as Christ obeyed as a servant to the point of death, we are called to live obediently since he is now seated in the heavens and sees all in all. Christ's obedience unto death, which led to his exaltation, is the pattern for the Christian. This is why he says, therefore. And all that follows in this text is grounded in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Philippian church had a good reputation. They had a good track record. You can say they all got along well for the sake of the gospel when all was well. When things were going smoothly. When the waters were still. But now that problems have arisen in the congregation, persecution from the outside and disputes over authority on the inside, their obedience is now put to the test. Any one of us with such pressure in our lives, our own obedience will be tested. So Paul here addresses our obedience. First, Paul gives us the manner of our obedience. Then what that obedience looks like in the context of the church and in the context of the world. And lastly, what is the goal or end of our obedience? But first, as for the manner of our obedience, Paul addresses them in the midst of trouble and problems brewing. He says, as you have always obeyed, so now in the midst of trouble, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He is calling them to genuine obedience, an obedience that comes from faith. This is what Paul would call the obedience of faith. We are called to obey the Lord not as people pleasers to be seen by others, but those who seek to please God genuinely, behind closed doors even. We don't just clean up and gather with so much love on Sunday and then hate one another on Monday. Because when you truly think about it, most of our Christian lives are private lives. Jesus said that God our Father will reward what we do in secret, not what we have been uh, seen to be done by others. And this causes a need for a greater attempt of obedience on our part. Because if we are to grow in our Christ-like obedience as a church... We must first grow in our Christ-like obedience as private individuals. Or do we obey just to please others around us, please the pastor, just to please the elders, or to be seen by others? Remember, they are not always there to see what we do behind closed doors. They can't see our hearts to see whether it is true zeal or not. It is said what we do in private when no one is watching really reveals what our desires are. Is our zeal truly for Christ or only true when people are around? And are there differing levels of obedience based on who's watching? Because we are called to obey both in private as well as in public. But what does he mean? We are to work out our own salvation. He, he is saying we are all individually responsible to work out our own salvation, salvation, which eventually has its effect in the church. But does he mean we are responsible to save ourselves? I thought I was saved by God and his grace alone. 
Notice, he doesn't say, work for your salvation. He doesn't say, work and follow these steps in order that you may be saved. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Meaning, work out what you already have. Work out what you already possess. Work with what, what you already have. You already have the salvation, so work it out. Put it to practice. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you own an exercise machine these days, uh, Bowflex, whatever it may be. And, and if you do own one, it's not going to do you much good if it's just sitting in the basement. You have to use it in order to gain the physical benefits. The same goes for our salvation and its spiritual benefits in this life. What he means is that we are to put our salvation to work. If we have salvation, we are to prove it. In what manner? With fear and trembling. As one who is anxious to do his duty as a Christian with genuine awe and reverence for God. Now, this is not living a constantly anxious life, worried about every decision one makes, whether God will approve, whether Crest or Colgate, or whatever choices you may have on a daily basis. But this means to live soberly and genuinely before God, in light of who God is, and in light of the greatness and goodness of God. It is to be conscious that we are here to please God and live before him and not to please men. Paul this, describes this life as a response to our great salvation, which we do not deserve from a caring heavenly father. We ought to live in awe of being loved by God as God is our father. And our obedience takes a different form and meaning in light of this truth. And in case we want to take credit for it or are discouraged, he both humbles and encourages us with this truth that grounds all of our doing. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here he covers the seen as well as the unseen work of God. It is God that gives us the will. He works in us and he causes us to work and he gives us the work for us to do and he will bring this work to its completion on the day of Jesus Christ. And it is all by his grace and power because without him, as Jesus says, we can't do anything now, this is a confusing and perplexing passage for most of us because it affirms that God is 100% responsible not only for our salvation, but for all of our obedience and good works that we produce. We will always have empty hands before God, pleading with God. But he also calls us to put those hands to work and that work is never disconnected from God. Once it is, it is just mere moralism or legalism. It can never be disconnected from God. Because all that we do is not in order to gain salvation. But it is from the will given to us by God and the work to please God out of gratitude for the salvation we possess already. What a wonderful truth this is. That God is always present with us. Even in our good work. Working in us and through us. Despite how undeserving we are. So working out our salvation given to us freely by God. Out of his pure grace means that we would apply these truths to every area of life genuinely because salvation affects every area of life and we know we don't live within these church walls seven days a week 
Most of us gather here one day a week if we can. And much of our Christian lives are li lived either in private, at home, with family, at work, or at school, or with friends. So we would be asking questions like, what does it mean to work out our salvation in these areas? With awe and reverence to please God. What does it mean to be an obedient Christian? What does it mean to be an obedient spouse? Or an obedient parent? Or an obedient child? Or just a good friend? What does it mean to be an obedient citizen or employee, etc., etc.? But most importantly, given Paul's context, we would be asking, what does it mean to be an obedient church member? Or brother or sister in the Lord? So we ask ourselves, how do we work out our salvation within this context here? The gathering of the saints in the church is the place where our salvation manifests itself the most as we gather. So what is his good pleasure? What exactly pleases God most amongst brothers and sisters? What is this obedience that Paul calls us to here, specifically within the church context? He says, as we live in this church age, here and now, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Grumbling here is different than the grumbling in, in the book of James. Here it's, it, it, takes, it goes a step further than just complaining under one's breath. It actually leads to a private planning, usually against leadership, just as we saw in our text this morning when they grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, desiring to go back to Egypt because that is where they feasted the most. This grumbling, it is a discontentment that leads to sin and dissension in the body of Christ. So what pleases God is that dissension and division would come to an end in the church. Why? Because in gratitude and discontentment in the church and in the people of God is a denial of God's saving grace. And no doubt our spiritual progress will be hindered by our grumbling and disputing and complaining. Not only that, but we would not be displaying to the world that we are children of God. Jesus said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So here we are to consider our witness in the world and how our disputes may have an effect on those from the outside looking in. Not only for the sake of evangelism or to draw people in, but also that we may silence the ignorance of foolish people, as Peter says. For the world operates in grumbling, fighting, fighting discontentment and they'll look at us and say see they're just like us so let us run the church as we do the world the world lies in darkness and, it, and as Paul describes it is a crooked and twisted generation he is speaking of everyone outside the true church, outside of salvation in Christ. And Peter says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And we profess that we have been saved. And how? Through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved and called to work out our salvation. And when we work out our salvation, there is a goal. And that goal is that we may shine as lights in the world, as blameless and innocent children of God, as God is the cause of all of our working. Israel was called to shine as lights 
They were called to shine as a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Now, when Israel failed at this, Daniel uh, makes a prophecy that in the end times, there will be those who are wise, who shine like the brightness of the sky above, turning many to righteousness. And Jesus fulfills this, and then he says to his disciples, You are the light of the world, a lamp that is put on a stand to give light to all in the house. And this is not our own doing. Just that as, as it is God who works in us, his children, to will and to work for his good pleasure, we don't shine as lights from just being good and polite people. We, we don't shine as lights as just being tolerant of every belief in the church. There are many who would want this and want us to submit to this idea. But he calls us to be blameless and innocent children of the one true God without blemish, shining as lights in the world. And it doesn't stop there. Paul is famous for run-on sentences and he says, holding fast to the word of life. We shine as lights only if we have light. And the light is found in his word. Our shining as lights as children of God is not disconnected from the word of God. Because it is the word of God that tells us how to live as children of God. It tells us what sin is, what sin is not, and leaves to our discretion what is indifferent. It is a lamp to our feet that describes how we are to be as a light to the nations. I believe much of the infighting that occurs in these churches and in the churches in Paul's days is when someone tries to impose what is unclear in Scripture or what has clearly passed away. We see such as circumcision. And when we fight over such things, we look like the world. But if we look like the world, where is the evidence of salvation in this world? We are to be like lights of navigation, showing the world where salvation is and where salvation is proclaimed every week. But in bringing the gospel with our lips, professing to know God, we can deny him by our works. And this can be nothing but the works of darkness and not the works of light. And we may have the appearance of godliness and wisdom, but deny its power and what our faith is truly about. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we would be missing out. Why? Because there are blessings associated with our obedience. Because the end goal is not only to shine as light, lights before others, but it is also for our spiritual blessings. And this deserves the highest sacrifice to attain. Consider Paul who labored over the Philippians, not only to convert them, but also that they may prove to be disciples of Christ. In his mind... The end was always in sight for the day when Christ would return. He gives his reasoning why they are to obey and to work out their salvation, not only to be witnesses to the world, but also so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud. That's a blessing. This is not selfish pride as he once declared, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, but this pride is the pride of seeing the fruits of his labors for the sake of Jesus Christ. And that he did not run in vain or labor in vain, living as Christ lived. Just as when Jesus cursed the fig tree for not producing, he was speaking again of the old order of things, the law and the temple, and how the law cannot produce the fruits that he came to produce, 
And now that we are under God's grace, if we do not produce, those who labor over our souls would have labored in vain. All the sacrifices made in laboring and toiling in order to produce an abundance of grace-filled lives. And if we continue to grumble over every decision made in the church or over the preached word every week or over the constant proclamation of the gospel, if we get bored with the gospel and no longer receive the word of Christ, and if we end our lives and show ourselves not to be believers at all, It would have all been in in vain. But yet for Paul and for many of us, this labor is worth it. The sacrifice is nothing in comparison to the great reward. The labor to see that we do not grumble and dispute that we live as Christians in a dark world has its rewards and blessings. And it comes when Jesus returns. Our labors to obey within the church context is evidence of grace in our lives. Grace does not send us in a complacent direction or in a standstill. But we are to work out our salvation and bear the fruits of repentance and love for one another. Paul speaks of the extreme that he is willing to go to as he says, even if I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. He is referring to when the priest would make a sacrifice upon an altar and to go to that sacrifice, he would make a libation. He will offer up a complimentary drink, just like red wine goes with Red meat, but for holy use. His death and execution, his blood being spilled as a drink offering for the sake of Jesus Christ and his church, he says, would only complement the sacrifice of their faith. He saw their faith as more important than his own death. If their faith proved to be true, what he is saying is a paradox. He is not caring for his own life anymore. He wanted them to turn around and to love one another. His death and execution, his blood being spilled. He is saying it would please him in the greatest sacrifice for him. Is not his own death, but is that their faith would be genuine in its outworking. Not just to please him, but to please God. So in the last day when Christ returns, he would be proud that he did not run or labor in vain, even if he dies for it. Because with that, with that result in mind, We should all rejoice. You see, Christian joy is at stake. The blessing of being a church that rejoices over all that God has done and is doing in redeeming his people. This blessing and joy is at stake when we don't live in peace with one another. So it's not only that our witness in the world is hindered, but our rejoicing would be hindered. Paul just demonstrated that he wanted to live as Christ lived and died as Christ died for the sake of the church. So we are to consider Christ and his self-humbling. He did not lay, lay down his life as the ultimate sacrifice for himself, but as an offering to his father for us. And he went to the cross silent as a lamb before its shearers. 
He died for our pride and our lack of love for one another as a suffering servant. So the question would be for us today is, are we willing to sacrifice ourselves and our indifferent opinions for the sake of others? The answer to that question is of utmost importance for the life and joy of the church. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for sharing this great truth from your scriptures to us today. And we pray that you would apply these to our hearts as we go about our week, that we may shine as lights in a darkened world. Through Christ I pray. Amen.